Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 350, Operation Primrose. Last time, we saw subs like the Upholder carry on against enemy troop ships heading to North Africa, and every victory was needed as Rommel was causing havoc on his way to Alexandria to take Admiral Cunningham's main base away. It would have been nice if the British Royal Navy and RAF could have matched the sub's actions in the skies and the water surface, but no matter, the defenders and citizens of Malta were about to get a reprieve of sorts, not that they knew this was coming. Nor did they know of Hitler's decision not to invade Malta, as he was saving his all for Soviet Russia. But a guess could have been hazarded by the authorities on Malta, given the information that they were given by a man who only made sense of his life when he was up in the air, that is, Adrian Warburton, or Warby, as he was called. Throughout the month of May 1941, he and other reconnaissance pilots of 69 Squadron reported that the German pilots were leaving Italy in large numbers. The question was, who was going to be their next victim? Governor Dobby used this information to warn the commands around him, like in North Africa and the Middle East, that the Germans were up to something big. Someone was about to receive a rain of hammer blows. Yet before the Germans left, they had one last surprise for the Allied airmen on Malta, specifically the new arrivals of 249 Squadron, like Tom Neal and Tommy Thompson. Though most of Flieger Corps 10 had already moved on to Poland, there lingered Joachim Muchberg's fighter squad. Being told that they were about to ship out and that there were new pilots on Malta, Munchberg wanted to give Malta a big goodbye, and yet the new pilots there a big hello. Both messages would be comprised of bullets and bombs. On May 25th, the two Toms and 249 Squadron officially took over from 261 Squadron, who were on their way to Egypt for a much-deserved rest. 249 Squadron had already broken into two flights, Flight A and Flight B. One flight would stand ready for the first part of the day, and the second flight would take over for the rest of the time that there was daylight. Tom Neal was in charge of Flight B, while Butch Barton was in charge of Flight A, of which... Tommy Thompson belonged. As it made sense, 249 Squadron was based at Takali, roughly in the center of the island. This way, they would have equal time to get to any threatened area. As has been seen in many movies, shows, and photos, the pilots on duty sat on lawn or simple chairs around a hut, which had a phone connected to fighter control, this time at Lascaras, on the capital's peninsula, just west of the Grand Harbor. And it was this way at Takali as well, but just. Instead of a hut, which had been bombed by the Germans long ago, the telephone line here ended in a bell tent. As for the chairs, the objects the men sat on did their job, but again, just. As for fighter control, they were connected with the radar station on the Dingley Cliffs on the island's southern shore and it would be this unit that would first detect enemy planes on their way. Thus, this would start a series of calls that would end at Takali. The problem for Butch Barton and A-Flight was that, having fought in the Battle of Britain, the entire setup there, from communications and detection to accommodations while they waited for the next wave, had been much nicer. Still, needs must. Back on May 25th, as A-Flight had the first shift, they enjoyed the moderate morning temperatures, though it was warming quickly, not to mention the lack of enemy fighters. By noon, the heat and humidity had arrived, as did B-Flight. Tom Neal and company took over, sat down, and began melting in the hot sun. The quiet began to bother Tom Neal. What about all the horror stories of massive waves of enemy aircraft flying over Malta? Thinking the phones might be down, Tom called fighter control, but was told all was well with the system and all was quiet. Later, Tom heard an air raid siren in the distance. He ordered the pilots into their planes and called fighter control again, yet their answer had not changed. 
The system is working. We haven't received any word from the radar unit. In summation, all was well. You new guys need to calm down. But Tom was not a new guy. He had been around long enough to know that whatever side got the jump first, things tended to go well for them. Not so much the other side that got trounced. Anywho, Tom, getting frustrated, jumped into his hurricane, thinking a call would come through at any moment. It did not, but another siren rang out, and this one was closer than the last. Jumping out of his hurricane, Tom raced over to the tent and had the operator contact flight control again. Their message had not changed again. But as Tom had been running to the tent, the operator, seeing him coming, had already started the call. So as Tom was running towards the operator and the phone was ringing at flight control, suddenly all around Tom could hear and then see the three 109s screaming from out of nowhere. The attackers strafed the airfield, which Tom just happened to be on, forcing him to throw his body to the ground. Somehow the bullets hit all around Tom, but he himself was spared. As the Germans flew away, they were laughing with this successful, undetected approach and subsequent destruction of enemy planes, while on the ground, no less. Well, it was time to get back to Italy and then start their trip. However, this one unit of Munchbergs would be sent to North Africa, not Poland. There, they would continue to harass the Allied troops who were standing in Rommel's way. As Tom stood and surveyed the area, he saw two hurricanes on fire and two more damaged, along with two pilots who were clearly injured. It could have been worse, but it could have been a hell of a lot better had he been given the proper warning. Clearly, this was not North Weald, with its smooth-running organization. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who was getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins versus Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. When the last of the Germans left southern Italy on June 1st. Malta only had 42 hurricanes left. Munchberg alone had downed 20 enemy aircraft, and during his time based in Sicily, the German flight leader had not lost a single pilot. There were changes for the defenders as well, but not because the Germans were leaving, but perhaps because of what they had accomplished over Malta. On the last day of May, Air Commodore Forrester Maynard was replaced by Hugh Pugh Lloyd. Soon, the lads would know him as Hugh Pugh, but as he had been a bomber commander officer, he knew what he was doing. Certainly, as his orders were to continue with the harassing air raids and stopping troop ships from reaching the North African coast. And as Hugh Pugh knew the value of air reconnaissance, he and Warby would soon be spending lots of time together. But it was what Hugh saw when looking over his pilots that gave him pause. Clearly, these men had been pushed to the breaking point, not that there had been much of a choice. But now that more pilots were coming in, like 46 Squadron, also from North Weald, some of these long-timers could be sent home. And one of the first to go was George Burgess. Hugh took one look at him, asked a few questions, and ordered that he make for the home island. 
Yet First Burgess was asked to stop by the Captain Caruana's bar in Valletta. Burgess did as he was told, but instead of a few fellow pilots waiting for him, the place was packed with locals who knew all he had done inside and outside of the cockpit to safeguard their island, their homes, their lives. He was given a silver cigarette case with the inscription, a small token of appreciation from a handful of Maltese. Burgess had to admit that he did not know a single face in the crowd, but they, every one of them, knew his. It should be apparent by now that Adrian Warburton, or Warby, the reconnaissance photographer pilot, could have been summed up with the following phrase. He didn't get that quite right, did he? It had been the case before coming to Malta and his first few months on Malta since September of 1940, and his curious ways still continued. However, no one could argue with the results. During that May of 1941, Christina Ratcliffe, Warby's paramour, and the other members of the Whizbangs were on a bus, heading away from the capital to put on a show for the troops and pilots that could not make it to Valletta. Suddenly, the driver of the bus slammed on the brakes, yelled, Air Raid! Opened the door and dove out. This all happened rather quickly, so it took Christina and the others a second to catch up, but then they all ran off the bus. It was Christina that looked up, stopped running, and said, Oh, don't worry, it's only Warby. And sure enough, the friendly plane came on, getting ever lower and closer to the bus. By this point, even Christina thought that Warby was about to meet his end, all because he told her the previous day that he wanted to fly over her bus. And this he did, yet he failed to mention, but maybe it wasn't planned out, of the few inches that he was going to leave in between the bottom of his plane and the top of the bus. Either way, the plane zoomed down and then began to climb. Christina may have felt something like, that old Warby, but everyone else was thinking, I'm going to kill that guy if I ever get a chance. So much for a simple flyby that was to have served as a loving gesture. Another example of Warby being Warby was when he and his crewmate, Patty Morin, started carrying several 25-pound incendiary explosives on their reconnaissance flights. Their plan, and it was incredibly straightforward, was to, once they were over a target, open the lower hatch and push out several bombs or one bomb. No streamlined exacting protocol here. But on one occasion, communications were mixed up and Warby prematurely pulled back on his control, causing the plane to go into a steep climb. Of course, he assumed the crew had already released the last bomb. They had not. So the bomb and crewmen went sliding back to the rear of the plane. The former, that is the bomb, had already ignited. The latter was now most desirous to get the former out of his damn plane. They eventually worked it out. Another less-than-stellar moment came when the crew was taking photos of the Gulf of Patras in central Greece. Chance would have it that an Italian seaplane was also in the area, so the two aircraft were soon chasing each other, trying to get off a lucky shot. At one point after his first pass, when Warby was turning around for another go, his cockpit's perspect canopy shattered and Warby felt a strong tug at his chest. The next moment was something out of Catch-22. Warby, I've been hit! Patty Moran, where? Warby, in the chest! To this, Patty explained, no, you didn't. If you were hit in the chest, we would not be having this conversation. Warby, well, almost in the chest then. It turns out, not that Warby would know this until after they landed, but the bullet had indeed penetrated his chest, up to one-fourth of an inch. So the pain was real, the blood all over the place, the threat to his life, not so much. Warby's plane eventually landed at Luca, and the flight commander, the Australian Titch Whiteley, was there with a first aid kit. Again, the actual wound was not that bad, though there was a lot of blood, a small indention in Warby's chest, and the culprit, the bullet, somehow fell into his front pants pocket. A typical day for Warby and the gang. 
After this, Warby was told to rest, and when someone looked at his record, they found that he, like many others, had not had a break since his arrival. Hence, Warby and Patty were sent to Gibraltar to pick up a Maryland bomber on May 26th. As they had a few days off, the men decided to then fly their new plane to neutral Tangiers. There, in a bar, they were bought a round by German pilots, and all the aviators of whatever nationality gathered, drank beer, and swapped stories. As for Warby's girl, Christina Radcliffe, she applied to be a plotter for the RAF. It wasn't so much almost getting killed by her boyfriend pilot that pushed her to this, but rather there was less gasoline available for their bus, hence their show performances were drastically reduced. Fighter control at Las Carces was actually underground. It was called the hole by the many who worked there. Before descending, anyone going down to the hole had a relatively nice view of the Grand Harbor, if one could ignore the devastation. Christina would soon learn the process of detecting and intercepting enemy planes. The RAF operations room had large maps of Sicily, where the Germans had been based, Malta, of course, and the surrounding Mediterranean. The map was sectioned often into grids, with horizontal and vertical lines evenly dividing it. A call would come into the room from a radar station or an observer along the coast, saying that an enemy plane had been spotted. The plotters were given the information and started plotting, that is, putting down markers that followed the path of the approaching enemy plane. From this, the controller would vector or steer his pilots to engage the enemy. Fortunately for all of Malta and the entire war effort, the new guy, again, Hugh Pugh, had much more experience than Maynard did, who had been getting by on sheer grit and faith alone. But Hugh's experience paid off right away. It didn't take long for him to figure out that back on May 25th, when Tom Neal was surprised by those three German 109s, the planes had flown in under the radar. The coastal observers saw them and sounded their alarms, but for whatever reason, the report did not make it back to the operations room. Well, Hugh Pugh would fix that. No more surprises. Another person working at Lacarsis was Suzanne Palby, the young lady who had the cruel admiral of a father who had wanted a boy, thus he had treated her badly. Her relatively new marriage was going well, if only because her and her husband were kept busy. He was in the regiment, and they only saw each other a few times a month. Her job, from the start, had been with military intelligence, specifically encoding and decoding messages. When she had first come on board, her job had to be done manually. The key to the codes was changed daily, thus she had to look up each number in the code book. But by June, that had changed. As Malta was important to Churchill and certain others of the War Council, the sending of the Typex machines, of which did much of Suzanne's job, was made a priority, which was fortuitous for Suzanne and the others who did her job. The amount of signal traffic had been growing steadily. The British had been able to read Italian naval ciphers for a while now, and in May, a German Enigma decoding machine had been taken from a U-boat. Now those messages were added to her pile as well. U-boat 110, a type IXB sub, had its keel laid down on February 1st, 1940. She was launched in August and commissioned on November 21st, 1940, under the command of Captain Lieutenant Fritz Julius Lemp. The sub was new, but Lemp had prior experience. Indeed, he was the one who sunk the passenger liner SS Athenia the very day Great Britain declared war on Nazi Germany, September 3rd, 1939. Two days before her sinking, September 1st, 1939, the Athenia, captained by James Cook, left Glasgow and headed for Montreal via Liverpool and Belfast. On board were 1,103 passengers, which included 500 Jewish refugees, 469 Canadians, 311 U.S. citizens, and 72 U.K. subjects. The remaining 316 people were crew. 
At 1 p.m. on September 2nd, the passenger liner was spotted by U-30, at the time led by Lemp, as it was just northwest of Ireland. The Athenia was zigzagging as war seemed imminent, which Lemp used as an excuse, claiming he thought she was a troop ship. He tracked his target for the next three hours, balancing a desire to be aggressive against the uncertainty of the ship's purpose. When the ship was near Torrey Island, about 14 kilometers northwest of Ireland, Lemp sent out two torpedoes. One hit the ship's port side in her engine room. The ship slowed to a stop, and her stern began to lower itself into the water. Right away, the passenger ship sent out a distress signal and was heard by numerous other ships in the area. The F-class destroyer HMS Fame was sent to harass the sub, while the E-class destroyer HMS Electra, along with a few others, went in to save the passengers and crew. The Athenia lasted for another 14 hours, but went under at 10.40 a.m. the next morning. Some 981 passengers and crew were saved. However, 98 passengers and 19 crew members were not found and retrieved for a variety of reasons. After word of all this got out, Grand Admiral Reeder, in command of the Kriegsmarine, told an American representative in Berlin that his U-boats had nothing to do with that sinking. But then, Lemp returned home, and he told Admiral Donitz and Reeder that he did sink the Athenia, but it had been a mistake. All this got to Hitler, who wanted it all kept quiet, as the war was just starting and the various countries were choosing sides. Thus, Lemp was not court-martialed, but only for that reason. Fast forward back to May 1941, Captain Lieutenant Lemp, now in command of U-110, was still aggressive. On March 16th, U-110 had damaged the Arodana, a motor tanker just south of Iceland. Lemp left 36 men dead and 21 survivors. Next, the Norwegian merchant Cyril Malm was also damaged on March 23rd. Lemp had given chase and, in fact, had fired on the Norwegian merchant twice, but both torpedoes missed. The third torpedo did strike true, yet it turned out to be a dud. The result was a dent in the side of the ship and a frightened crew. Not wanting to waste any more torpedoes, Lemp ordered all his guns to attack Yet the deck gun exploded as the crew forgot to remove the water plug. This left a frustrated Lemp with only his 37mm and 20mm AA guns to fire on the ship. The Suralman went to full speed and Lemp was about to give chase when he found that the exploded deck gun had caused pipe damage to his sub. Thus, the chase was over. Not that the Suralman's future brightened any. Just a few months later, on September 26, as a part of the convoy HG-73, the ship was hit by one torpedo from U-124. It went down immediately, just northeast of the Azores. After repairs, Captain Lemp took his sub-110 out again. On April 27, 1941, Lemp and crew came upon, harassed, and finally sunk the steam merchant Henri Mori to the northwest of Ireland. The Henri Mori was built in 1921, but it simply did not have the speed to keep up with most of the other ships, and though she had been a part of the convoy SL-68 the month before, she was let go. On her way back to the UK, she was come upon by Lemp, and after his torpedo went into her engine room, the Henri Mori had four minutes of life left. There was a crew of 32, and most of these men were lost with the ship, as they were unable to pull away from the force of suction as the ship went down. Four men survived, but even their rescue was a horrid thing, as the swells never let up. Captain Lemp yelled to the men in the lifeboat as he was pulling away, Goodbye, you will be picked up shortly. Tell Winston Churchill there is a war on. Which brings us to Operation Primrose, and convoy OB-318. London had already broken the communication codes for the German Army and Air Force, but not its Navy, which worried Churchill, 
the former First Lord of the Admiralty. As he would go on to write, the only thing that ever really frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. Clearly, something had to be done, but for now, very little was written down. On May 2nd, 1941, Convoy OB-318 of 38 ships left Liverpool on its way to various ports of North America. The ships were being escorted by 7 EG of 10 warships, later 3 EG of 8 warships, including the HMS Bulldog, would join them, and they would be needed, as there were some 19 U-boats in the area. Only later would it be discovered that only 6 of those subs were actually in a position to fire on the convoy. Once the convoy was just east of Greenland, U-110 stalked and attacked the Esmond and Ben Head. Both ships were lost. But Captain Lemp would not have such an easy time of it anymore, as the British corvette HMS Abrieta tracked the sub down with his ASDIC, or sonar. The British destroyer Broadway followed along, and soon both Allied ships were dropping depth charges. But not to destroy U-110, but rather to force her to the surface. By this point, the Admiralty had put together a plan to get their hands on a German sub, specifically what was inside of it. By now, the B-class destroyer HMS Bulldog had joined in, and with the Broadway, they stayed on top of the now-damaged U-110. Broadway moved in to what appeared to be a ramming position, but suddenly she stopped and dropped two more depth charges. But this time, they were set to detonate only after they went under the sub. This worked as the servicing and damaged sub was rocked further by these latest explosions. Their situation was hopeless, but as Captain Lemp thought the sub would sink from its destruction, he ordered the crew to abandon ship. When the German crewmen emerged onto the gun deck, the two destroyers began firing on them. Some died from this, others from jumping overboard to avoid the bullets, yet they succumbed to the sea. Soon after, the British guns went quiet, as it was clear the Germans were trying to surrender. Besides, those in the know were realizing their deeper, secret plans were coming to fruition. The destroyers started coming closer to save the men in the water, but also to board the sub before it went down for the last time. Captain Lemp realized this and began to swim back to the sub to speed up its demise. But soon he went under, never seen again. Was this due to a bullet or fatigue? It's unknown, but he never reached the sub. In all, 15 Germans would die. Another 32 were captured and taken to Camp 23 in northern Ontario, Canada. With the Germans subdued, two smaller boats from the Bulldog, led by Sub-Lieutenant David Baum, reached the sub and got on board. Everything, anything that seemed of value was taken, including the sub's Kurt Signal book, a short signal book for the Enigma machine. This was grabbed by William Pollock, a former radio operator, who realized that the Enigma machine and its codebooks and ciphers were not standard equipment. Of course, he and the others could not really know what they had achieved, as Enigma was almost as secret as Ultra. The destroyer then began to tow U-110, but she gave up the ghost and sank on her way to Iceland. The ciphers, though, were taken to Bletchley Park via Scapa Flow, where the people there would break the RHV, that is, the code system that worked as a backup system when there was no functioning Enigma machine on hand. To show how secret all this really was, the operational name Primrose was not even given to the event and others like it for another seven months. Even President Roosevelt was not told of what happened by Churchill until January of 1942. As for the convoy, despite all this activity, but probably because of it, U-201 managed to get in and sink one of the ships of the convoy. But immediately the sub came under attack and had to flee, though she left undamaged. Early the next day, May 10th, the convoy was come upon by U-556, 
one ship was damaged, but even worse, the convoy had reached its dispersal point. The merchantmen went into different directions, and their escorts left to meet up with their next convoy. U-556 would follow one of these groups and sink two more ships. In all, OB-318 lost five ships. U-110 may not have reached its destination, but its Enigma machine and various code books did, that is, Bletchley Park, where the experts were waiting for them. In time, with these additions and others provided by the Royal Navy, Bletchley Park broke the German naval codes, which had a real impact on the shipping of the Atlantic as convoys were steered away from the large wolf packs. In June of 1941, Allied shipping losses were just over 400,000 tons. By the end of the next month, that was down to 80,000 tons. Over the next three years, some 1,400 signals were broken. Not that anyone in London would have bet on it at the time, but the Battle of the Atlantic had just been won. Coupled with the Battle of Britain, the British Empire would remain masters, along with their other allies, of the seas and air. Now it only remained to best the enemy on land. Postscript. Air Commodore for Malta, Forster Herbert Martin Maynard, or Sammy, as he was known to his friends, who was an ace during the Great War, had gotten Malta through its early dark times. A deeply religious man, he insisted that those that stayed as his guest at the governor's country residence at St. Alton Palace, and this number of people grew as more homes and apartments were destroyed, attend morning and evening prayers with him and his family. Leaving Malta, Maynard was transferred to RAF Coastal Command and then, in 1944, was put in charge of number 19 Reconnaissance Group. He died having done his duty on January 26, 1976. As for the Enigma machine, the following comes from the website edn.com, written by Mike Green. First created at the end of the First World War by Arthur Scherbius in Berlin, this rotary electromechanical enciphering device was used by the German Armed Forces and Secret Service throughout the 1920s and 30s. Its basic principle was that the letters would be substituted for others via the machine's electronical connections, and this was followed by shifts in the alphabet and further substitutions. The machine itself consisted of 26 keys, a plug board with which the substitutions were performed, and five rotors which set the alpha shifts. The total number of possible states of the machine was 10 to the 23rd power. This made a huge number of possible settings for any one day and left the Allies with an almost impossible task. The Germans were confident that, above all, the code was unbreakable. But then came Alan Turing, Bletchley Park, and others, of course. But that is another story for another day. For now, it should be known that the captured Enigma machine helped Bletchley Park break the naval code, and thus U-boat traffic was readable for a few more weeks, until the keys ran out. As for the German Army's messages, that code had been broken back in 1932 by Polish cryptographers who shared what they learned with the British and the French. And the Polish only got their hands on an Enigma machine because the Nazis accidentally sent it to Poland. It was recovered, but not before some very clever people in Warsaw got to look at it. Penny days are back with hundreds of deals under $15 at JCPenney. Check out cool closet basics like everyday family tees, just $9 for women and $7 for kids. And sweet home essentials like $5 quick dry home expressions bath towels. Or grab a coupon on the JCPenney app to get an extra 25% store wide. Great prices, easy savings. JCPenney. Offers and coupon valid on select styles through 423. Power Penny deals excluded from coupon. Other exclusions apply. See store or jcp.com for details.